So today a little bit of an unboxing because uh, we, we got uh, Santa Claus Marcel brought us a few things. Okay. So, really wondering where you are. You can't work in Astro Counter. This will do the trick. This is my favorite of all space instruments. Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that we recently opened a jet fighter computer from the 1950s that was full of gears. But what about using a mechanical computer in a spaceship and keep flying it until 2002? This is what the Soviets did with this space navigation indicator, colloquially known as the globus in the Western world. It started life in slightly simpler form in the very first Vostok spacecraft, the one that put Yuri Gagarin in orbit. Then this upgraded version was part of several generations of Soyuz control panels. You can see it in the panel of the original Soyuz 7K, the first version of the Soyuz. Here it is also paired with a mechanical clock that we restored in a previous episode. And it is still on the panel of the next generation Soyuz T. And then, still on the Soyuz TM, it's now paired with a digital clock, which we also restored in a previous episode. And yes, that's the Soyuz that flew to the space station with a mechanical computer until 2002. This is somewhat mind boggling. Who needs capitalist microcomputer chips when proletarian gears will do? and I might add, with Victorian style points to boot. This is Soyuz T or TM, so it's, it's later in the Soyuz program. Um, so 80s and up, so same kind of era as space shuttle stuff was going on, but this is a beautiful little instrument that's supposed to show you where you are over the globe when you're flying around in your Soyuz capsule, and lets you know what Radio stations are available to communicate with the ground as you're passing through their areas. Uh, and also has a mode that you can switch it into that shows where you might land if you decide to try to land right now. Can you turn the globe with the knobs? We haven't tried that yet. I think, uh, try the big one there, yes. So we'll oh, you wind it up. Yeah, it's gonna need to get kind of set. In there. Uh, look at the back, I think it has the same plug as the Soyuz clock. Uh, no, it's a different plug. You don't stuff. It has more stuff. Yeah, this one's been through a little so, uh, G-testing. I thought you, it would have the exact same plug as the uh, mechanical Soyuz clock, but it looks like it has more pins. Oh, well, there's more happening. It's all full of gears inside, isn't it? Yeah. It's an analog computer. Just open it for the first time. Oh, it's maybe the big dent. Can you show the big dent on the top right? One there. Yeah. One there. <laughs> so this one has had a tough life. And it's not coming apart despite have us having removed all the screws and we think it's held right here and this appears to be a tamper proof thing is it blown up so there's, there's a stamp of some kind um so there's no serviceable parts serviceable parts inside marcel what should we do it's gonna avoid the warranty yeah, yeah. we're, we're gonna show it's tamper resistant not right. tamper proof all right <laughs> tamper evident <laughs> okay it came right off it's just a stamp over the screw comrade you did it Someone told me if it's supposed to be the red wire or blue wire or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looks a lot better. Oh, something fell. Oh, that's, that's the scale. Now we're oh, 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 I'm, 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 I'm. Oh. Oh, look at that. Oh, it has electronics in it. I thought it was only gears. Maybe yeah, this is the newer one. This is the... So it was T kind of era. It looks like it has a little solenoid ratchet. 
This is a beauty. Oh, and the cardi cardioid cam here. So there, uh, there is an analog computer with gears. There's a key. Wee. This looks so fragile. But it looks like it held up to the dents. Yeah. Well. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, you can undent it now from and the it other seems side. There's a Ukrainian flag here. Yeah. That is just stupendous. We found what I, why our globe is not moving because it's been dislodged, it looks like. It's not, this shaft is not in the middle. Oh, wait, I am not focusing right. Yeah, so this this is this is dislodged. Can we relodge it? Uh, absolutely, it's mechanical, it's repairable. How hard could it be? Mm. Yeah. Looks like it kind of scored. And the on the other course. side, it looks I don't know. Okay. Let's see if there is a simple way to get that globe and back in position. I think these these four screws. Right. So we definitely confirmed with our little dipstick endoscope that it was out of position where with the shaft bearing. By the way, this endoscope sponsored by the company Depstech is turning out to be quite a useful instrument. You can dive in restricted spaces such as in between gears inside this mechanism. This is a clip recorded directly by the endoscope. I'm trying to look for the end of the globe shaft which we think is dislodged. Not quite successful this first time around, but there sure are plenty of pretty gears around. Here I'm trying to make my way in from another angle. Trying to go past that gear in the, in the hole right there. Aha! I think I made it through. This is the money shot. I believe the hole next to the brass gear is where the shaft that holds the gear should be. So it's quite a ways off. We'll have to talk more about it in another video, but this is the Depstech DS520 endoscope in question. It has two cameras, one that looks at the end and one that looks at 90 degrees off to the side. You can even have the two camera views at the same time. Comes with a few useful attachments such as an end hook and a magnet to recover screws that you let fall at the bottom. Never happens to me, of course. And here's one that I made myself, a macro lens, so I can look up at readings of components from really close up. So quite a useful gizmo. And now that we know where the problem is, let's see if we can strategically take it apart without losing all the gears. We, we still didn't do our Star Trek. Feels like there's some pressure on here. Yeah. Sure yeah. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, before you do that, let's feel it because I, I could see it. Yeah, you released it, but your globe has crashed into the thing. Yeah. You got it. So it's not gonna come out without taking more stuff out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now this stuff is a little loose, we gotta watch that. Well, but it's only the board here that's in our way, right? This has a weighted thing on it too. So the globe is out, we took the board out and it was enough, but we could not put it back in at an angle, so. Free the earth. Yeah. Wow, this has this little gears at all kind of weird angles. Yeah, look at that, that's awesome. It's <laughs> incredible. It's so cool. There's those numbers for the station. Oh, that's how it. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of stickers on there. Isn't wow. There? And they are the, um, interestingly, they are the NASA ones. There's Madrid. And. Oh, so Ascension Island. So is that and Bermuda, See. Newfoundland? Well, you're pretty good. Yeah, Bermuda. Bermuda. So yeah. I, I I wonder if it's a Soyuz from the time yeah. of the space station, or yeah. it could have been Soyuz. Mir or something like that. Yeah, this was they used this in Salyut and then Mir. Since we had the globe out, we took some beauty shots. You can see more NASA tracking stations marked on it. TAN is for Tananariv in Madagascar, ACN is the Ascension Island Station, both stations used for the Apollo program. 
But then Master Ken got a close look at it. As we turned the globe around, we could see HAW for Hawaii, GDS for Goldstone in California, QUI is Quito in Equator, all tracking stations for the Apollo flights. And then on the lower left, in the middle of the Southern Pacific, Ken spotted a red dot marked VAN. This refers to the Vanguard tracking ship. The Vanguard was a World War II oil tanker modernized and converted into a missile tracking station in 1964. More famously, she supported the Apollo and Skylab programs. And guess what? One of her last assignments for the space program was the 1975 Apollo Soyuz test program, or ATP mission as it is known. This was the last Apollo flight where an Apollo and a Soyuz capsule docked in space, ushering a new era of collaboration which eventually led to the International Space Station. And guess where the Vanguard ship was stationed during the ATP mission? Master Ken managed to find that out, 25 degrees south and 155 degrees west. And sure enough, this is exactly where the red spot is, if you take into account that 155 degrees west is shown as 205 degrees east on the globe. So very likely this globus was either flown or used in training for the Apollo Soyuz mission. A bit broken for sure, but quite a score Marcel, quite a score. But while we are on the globe subject, note that the axis of rotation is fixed at an angle of 51.8 degrees in this case. This angle has to exactly match the target orbit of the flight or it will be useless. If you want to fly in another inclination, a different globe with a different angle has to be installed before launch. For more on this, I'll link Ken's blog article on the globus inner workings in the doodly-doo. But for now, we'd really want to know if we can repair our globus. Can you clean the glass on the inside? Yeah. You sure can. Okay, so it just has to go into the bearing. So I think the bearing took a beating, which is a problem. So we probably want to deburr it in that corner over there. Okay, we put the globe back in, and I think it works. Can you can you orbit us? Other direction. There you go. We are moving. We are in orbit. It doesn't want to orbit anymore. Turn that back the other way. I want the the inner one. Oh dang! I want to demonstrate orbit. Okay, we fix our problem, which was just a, a piece stuck in the back. And we are orbiting again. So the, is the top, the top one supposed to be longitude? And the side, the, the one on the side is latitude? Uh, well, it kind of looks like we have this point. one well, Right. Well but done. The top one is completely almost, wrong. The top one is very Obviously. wrong. Yeah. Yeah, because we didn't. Uh, but we 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 have to retime re it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, there should be an adjustment for that. I see. The course adjustment over here and the fine adjustment over there. All right. It seems that the burying the bearing and reinserting the shaft did it, minus the longitude indication that we eventually retimed correctly. But the rejoicing was tempered by our next discovery. I'll watch this wire so I can just gear here now. See it? Ooh. They have gone no, they are all cut. What? Somebody cut your wires. Demilled. <laughs> <laughs> this has been demilled, yep. Something has happened to it. So the this wires have been cut. This is not connected to anything. So this is all the wires from the connectors are not connected to anything. That's very annoying. So we, we want we found where the wires were supposed to go. They cut them so that this is the connector and they just lifted the plate and disconnected all the wires. These are connection block. What comes here comes out here and then it went over there. And it's connected all the ways here, all the ways there. Then cut a few more. Well, they were at it, maybe by mistake. <laughs> and so, decommission? What do you think, Marcel? Sabotage. 
This is so I weird. Think, I think because it was damaged mm -hmm. with the dents in it that yeah. it was considered unrecoverable and no one should attempt to use it. So this may have been their way of making sure it never gets attempted to use but still available for spare parts for other something else. Yeah, and they, and they, they closed it and put a stamp back in, right? Well, it was yes. sealed up again. Huh, that's really weird. But the good news is we're probably not missing any other parts. Then. Well, and, and it works. I mean, I, I can mm -hmm. no probe the thingy, make the globe turn. We turn all the things, everything does what it's supposed to do. We figured out a few things. Up, uh, yeah. So I've played with the Globus a little bit and I start to understand some of what it does. So this is your longitude as indicated here. This is to adjust your position on the orbit uh, with the latitude and longitude as indicated here. And right now we just departed from, departed from Kazakhstan and we are on an orbit and we are going to go back and fly right over it so here we are again so somehow this doesn't rotate the earth when i do it by hand because the earth should have rotated from under us so that's probably one of the clicky things in the back in flight, the mechanism is probably actuated by pulsing the green solenoid here in a manner similar to the Soyuz clock we restored previously. And that should be... If they haven't changed it from the other Soyuz, it's half a second. Oh, look at this variable resistor here. So that's... That's the clock. So same, uh, same as the uh, Russian clock. This is CPR. Yeah. This was the Soyuz clock we revived previously. It took pulses every half second. Ken's research points to one second interval for the pulses on the globus, but we don't know yet for sure. We first have to figure out our cut wires. So two, two beats per second, and that will get it going. But there should be a way to adjust the position of the globe. Uh, over here, this is your the to adjust the length of your orbit uh, which is around 90 minutes and then you can adjust the main minutes and then you can adjust the one tenth of a minute and the one hundredth of a minute so these are not seconds they are it's a decimal number in in minutes and what that does is it changes this weird it, it it changes the height at which some of the cams rotate on this weird pinion this weird conical thingy over here see if we can focus on it can you do it yeah there's this guy and it has some cams riding on it and if i and there, this cam, you see that cam over here? So this guy over here rides up or down. And this thing rides on this shaft, higher or lower, and it's a cam and it probably, it, it goes on a um, differential and there are three of them and they probably subtract or add a little bit to the orbit calculation. And Master Ken came to the same conclusion and explains in his blog that this indeed adds a correction via a differential gear and a friction clutch. The clutch prevents the mechanism from backing up once the cam resets at the end of the rotation. This mechanism might be operated by a second solenoid we spotted at the back, but at this point I am not entirely sure. And down here, that's the orbit counter. So let me get back into my favorite location, Baikonur. Right, and then I'll go once around the Earth. And 90 minutes later, I'm done, completed one orbit. This is interesting, this, is, has, this has to do with the landing uh, indication and that's the landing angle. The, uh, the ground will tell you what your land, landing angle is. 
which is the difference in angle, angular difference between the point where you are now and the point where you're going to land. And when you put it in one of these modes, the globe will rotate and show you where you're going to land. And you can tell it doesn't do very much. So the landing point indication is implemented very straightforwardly by the two brown micro switches you see here. These two switches are separated by the landing angle set on the front panel. A DC motor simply advances the globe until a rotating arm triggers the second micro switch. And then it shows you where you land and then to reset it, it goes in the other direction and stops when it hits the first switch. So that leaves this dial here, which is a bit complicated, it has all kinds of angles. It has a dial within a dial and I am not sure what it does. We later found out from the manual that this is the light shadow indication which tells you in which part of your orbit you are going to get sunlight. The dial itself is very easy to read and is quite cleverly constructed with two rings sliding into each other. This has to be driven from the longitude indication. And uh, here there is an indicator and I think that's supposed to light up when you are over your landing zone. Something like that or where you should start your landing maneuver. And here I think this must be an SCR, so something that it, it's a solid state relay in essence. Maybe it starts to retro burning or something like that. There's also this prominent wire wound potentiometer that we saw earlier. This transmits your current position to other systems in the spacecraft. Next to it on the right, you can see one of the cams that he used to map the complex trigonometric functions for calculating the longitude and the latitude. There are two sets of these in the globus. And that's it for the tour of the amazing mechanical globus. Ken is already hard at work trying to make sense of the cut wires mess. Once he figures it out, maybe we can attempt to rewire it and try to make it work again. Well, that will be for a future episode. See you then!